And then I heard, this is a system being put in place this year. And then I heard wisdom that isn't wisdom. Wisdom that gets caught up in the worldly way of doing things. He said, you're gonna see a sign coming this fall. Hey y'all, this is Troy Black. So I wanted to give a short intro to the video you're about to watch and let you know it's about the topic of racism. And I wanted to make a couple quick points ahead of time just to kind of give some clarity to some of the things I say in the video. I had someone on my team that I trust watch this video before posting it, and they gave me some feedback and they said, some of these things aren't clear. So I wanted to make sure that they are. So I wanna make a few statements. Number one, sadly, racism still exists in the world today. And obviously it also exists here in the United States. But something else I wanna say ahead of time is that your skin color does not automatically make you a racist. So sometimes the media will try to sway things one direction or they'll generalize and say, everyone over here is like this or everyone over here has experienced this, but it really comes down to the individual. So the message you're about to hear is actually gonna be potentially addressing people in three separate camps or a combination of camps. The first one is people that are asking the question, how can I overcome racial prejudice if that's something I'm still dealing with? And some people may find themselves in that place. And that's something that God actually wants to bring resolution to and healing to. And it's something that he wants to change. The second camp is people asking the question, how should I respond when somebody labels me as a racist, yet I know that I'm not. And this is something that can happen because of the culture and the media and some of the ways that they paint a broad stroke across a lot of people instead of focusing on the individual. And the third camp is addressing people that are asking the question, how can I forgive and how can I move forward when I've been the victim of racism? So whether you fall into one of these camps or none of them at all, the thing that the devil is trying to do today in our culture is he's trying to get us to stay angry so that the hurts don't heal. But God is wanting to heal hearts today. He's wanting to heal the hurts and he's wanting to start that healing process within the church where it needs to take place. So I am not trying to jump on any of the bandwagons on either side that the media is pushing or any of the narratives that they're trying to sell. I'm just trying to share and deliver the message that God gave me. One last thing before I share this message, some great resources that I believe may help if you would like to do more of a biblical dive into the issue of racism and how the church should respond to it today. I would highly suggest a playlist on YouTube and it's called Kingdom Race Theology and it's by Dr. Tony Evans. He also has a book of the same title, Kingdom Race Theology. The links to both of those resources are gonna be below. And I believe Dr. Tony Evans is one of the most profound voices talking about this issue today within the church. Some of the things he talks about within that playlist and within that book are the sin of racism, race and the church, race issues in America today, and then also things like white guilt. So if you're interested in any of those topics, I would encourage you to go listen to that playlist and check out the other resources that he has available. So without further ado, let's jump into this message. Hey y'all, this is Troy. So I'm gonna be talking about a prophetic word that God gave me today. And this has to do with a sensitive topic, the issue of racism. This is not necessarily my opinion in a lot of ways. It's what God has given me to say. And the Lord actually gave me a word about something that's happening in the culture and a sign that we're going to see take place at a certain time. And I believe this is here in the United States, but I also believe this word will apply more generally than that. So there's this sign that God's speaking about, but I also believe that God has given me a very simple message to share when it comes to how do we deal with this issue that is so prevalent in our world today and has been something that our nation has struggled with for such a long time. This is what happened. I was actually watching a TV show that I enjoy watching for the most part called The Andy Griffith Show. So it's an older TV show and it actually was playing on the air back when a lot of the civil rights stuff was actually happening in the United States. So it was an interesting time for a show to be on the air. And you can see some interesting things happen in the show in that it ran for eight seasons and then was canceled. And then they rebooted it and they called it something else. It was called Mayberry RFD. The distinction I noticed between the original series and the reboot was there were no African-American main characters in the original series. But then once it was rebooted, 
they actually brought in some African-American characters, which I thought was really awesome and obviously was needed. It was a very interesting time in history where a lot of things that needed to be changed were beginning to change. But this is what happened. So I was watching this show and in the show, this character, Andy Griffith, is supposed to be a very wise person, wise individual. And I'm going to share with you a dream I had about him in a second that God gave me a while back. But he's almost like a King Solomon type of character in the show. And in one episode, his son, Opie, actually refers to him as King Solomon. And so I was watching the show and I heard the Lord say this suddenly. The Lord said, Solomon, quote unquote, Solomon is returning. He said, in stride. And then he said, a movement toward racism awareness through a simple system instituted in this country. So I believe this is something that's going to be taking place in the nation that we're going to see. And then I heard the Lord say this. He said, this is both good and evil, meant to tackle racist remarks, but also a hard stance that keeps people from speaking freely. And then I heard a barbed wire fence, keeping those in the wrong doing right, but also potentially hurting the random passerby who shows no sign of doing wrong. And then I heard, this is a system being put in place this year. And then I heard, wisdom that isn't wisdom. Wisdom that gets caught up in the worldly way of doing things. So this is where I believe God is making the distinction. As Christians, we should be the least racist people on earth. Okay, We should be the most loving, the most caring, the most kind-hearted, generous individuals. And unfortunately, what we've seen is the history of the church is a lot of times it hasn't been the case. And if there's any racial prejudice that's happening in our hearts as Christians, that's something we need to deal with with the Lord. We need to allow the Lord into that space to change that, to heal that, to transform us, to make us look more like Jesus. But at the same time, I believe that some of the ways that the culture is trying to go about fixing some of these issues that we're having are not necessarily the best. And so this is what the Lord said next about this system that they're putting in place. He said, people are more interested in making a power play and a statement than protecting people's rights. I'm going to say that again. People are more interested in making a power play and a statement than protecting people's rights. What I believe the Lord is saying is on the outside, it's going to look good and it's going to look like people have the right motivations, but behind the scenes, they're not necessarily going to be doing it for the right reasons. When it comes to morality, this is the difference between doing the moral thing or the right thing outside of a real relationship with God and doing the right thing inside of a real relationship with God. I remember doing the quote unquote right thing when I didn't know the Lord for the wrong reasons. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying that never happens today. But what started happening when I came into a relationship with Jesus Christ was he began to actually transform me from the inside out. And suddenly my heart began to change and I I wanted to do the right thing for the right reasons. Now, you know, it's not like I just want to be seen as morally good. I want to know in my heart that I did what God was asking me to do and that I treated people the way that he wanted me to treat people. And so the Lord said this next, he said, you're going to see a sign coming this fall. And so I believe he's talking about this system. And I got this impression after this that this could have something to do with the school system and and teachers at their desk or something like that. But then I heard after that a faulty system. So I I believe the Lord is saying that something behind this is not set up right. It's not going to necessarily work out the way they want it to. And the motivations are not necessarily coming from a great place. But the Lord gave me this simple encouragement that I want to share with you today is that how do we actually fix this issue, right? And it starts in the church. You know, like if something's going to change in culture, it has to first change in the church. And here's what I believe is that we cannot fix an issue like this if Jesus is removed from the picture. And that's why the world's way of doing things always fails eventually. And the Lord gave me this dream a couple years back, I believe. And in the dream, I was talking to the actor and the guy that helped create the Andy Griffith show, Andy Griffith. And in the dream, I was talking to him, and this was a prophetic dream. I woke up out of it, and I could feel the presence of God, and I knew God was trying to make a point. But I was talking to him in the dream. I said, hey, I'm actually from the future. So somehow, you know, I went back, and I was on the set of the show, and I was like, yeah, I came from like 2020, you know, and I came back here, you know, and and he got all excited in the dream, and he said, wow, he said, tell me what it's like. Tell me what 
the world is like, tell me what the society is like. Things are so much better, right? And he was saying that because I could tell that he was attempting to pass down wisdom through this show and some of the moral lessons that they taught and that kind of stuff to a culture. He's trying to impact a culture. And he, and he said, because of the things we're teaching now, like, like things have got to be so much better then, right? And I, I just looked him in the eyes in the dream and I said, I said, I said, no, no, it's, it's not better in, in some ways. It's changed, but in a lot of ways, it's gotten worse. There's a lot of evil in the world still. And he just couldn't believe it. He was dumbfounded, you know? And the reason is because the worldly way of doing things is never ultimately going to work because the heart hasn't been changed. If the heart is not changed, then the problem's not going to go away. And only Jesus can ultimately change the heart. And that's the big difference between Christianity and all of the other religions, is that Jesus is able to change our hearts in a way that we're never able to change them on our own through all of the study, all of the good habits, all of the effort, all of the time. It's never enough. But the thing that really changes our hearts is when we find out that the God of the universe loves us so much that he was willing to come down to the earth as a man. And he was willing to live a perfect life and go through temptation and trials and struggles and hardship. And then at the end of his life, he was willing to give himself up to be crucified on a cross. And he did all of this for us because he loves us. And when we hear that message and we believe it, it begins to do something to our hearts. It begins to melt our hearts. Or we say, wow, what kind of love is this? I've never known anyone that would love me that way. This is what Philippians 2, 3 through 8 says. Now, this may seem like a high standard, but we've got to consider that the standard is being set, but we're not able to meet it in our own efforts. The only way to meet this standard is to humble ourselves and to allow Jesus to come take over, to allow him to change our hearts from the inside out. So it says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility, consider one another as more important than yourselves. Man, that is a high standard. Consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he's saying, do this because this is the way Jesus lived. This is how he was. And then it says, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. So even though Jesus had rights, and even though he had this status as God, he didn't hold on to that. And instead, he set it aside for a time, and he came down and he lived among us because God loved us. And he thought about our needs above his own. And man, I just sense the Holy Spirit saying this today. Many of us are saying to the Lord, Lord, I, I can't do that. That's, that's too difficult. And I hear the Holy Spirit saying this so clearly. He's saying, with my help, you can. Let me come in. Let me empower you. Let me change you if it's necessary. Let me transform what's dead into something that's alive. What's old into something that's new. Let me give you a new way of thinking about things. Let me give you a new way of looking at things, I hear the Lord saying. And I hear the Lord saying, this world is never going to figure it out, no matter how hard they strive towards perfection and towards moralism. And I hear the Lord saying, but I've already given you the key to change. It's looking at Jesus. It's looking at what he's done for you. It's looking at the cross. And it's not looking away until it changes you. And what happens, y'all, when this change takes place is we begin to look different. Verses 14 and 15 says, Do all things without complaining or arguments, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. We're going to look different to the world. They're going to reject even the good things that we try to do because of the way that we're doing them, or because our motivation doesn't align, or because we're not stepping in line with the way they do things, or whatever it is. We're, we're going to stand out as Christians. But here's the amazing news is we get to stand out together as Christians. No matter which country we live in, no matter our ethnicity, no matter our class, no matter our status, no matter our past, as Christians, we are all part of a family. This is something you're never ever gonna find anywhere else in the world. This is what Ephesians 2, 12 through 16 says. It says, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the people of Israel, now, this is talking about the difference between the Jews and the Gentiles, but we can apply it more broadly as well. 
to all believers. It says, and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. We were all at that place at one point. But this is what the Lord did. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the hostility, which is the law composed of commandments expressed in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two one new person, in this way establishing peace. How did Jesus bring peace between all people who are are willing to come to him? It's through the truth that none of us deserve to be in his family, but he brought us in because of his love, because of his grace, because of his kindness because of his forgiveness. And that truth is able to unite two people that on the outside seem to be completely different, but on the inside, they're both filled with the same love, the same hope, and the same Holy Spirit. This is verse 16, it says, and that he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the hostility. This is the last thing I'm sensing is This is God's plan for the church, is that we are going to shine as lights, but this is God's desire, is that we would be united in such a way that the world would even look in and say, how did y'all fix this issue? How are y'all so at peace with each other? How are y'all so united with each other? How is there so much love between Christians? And we can point to the answer. We can say it's because of Jesus. And God's gonna use the love that we have for one another as a witnessing tool to shine the light of Jesus Christ to the world. So I hope this video has been encouraging. I love you so much, and I'll see you next time.